254 miles above the surface of the Earth, the world's most expensive laboratory, the only one of its kind in existence, orbits around the world once every 90 minutes. The International Space Station is the most complex structure that humankind has ever constructed. But how did this testament to technology and the pursuit of knowledge ever come to fruition? The ISS, like all collaborative efforts in space prior and since, are the result of a mission that dared to break barriers between nations who wanted nothing to do with each other, right in the midst of the Cold War. However, the crews who carried out this historic mission seem to have faded with the fall of the Soviet Union. The year is 1962. It is a troubling time for the United States. Just one year ago, the Soviet Union achieved two great victories. It had sent the first man into space, and its ally, Cuba, had resisted the Bay of Pigs invasion. It is discovered that Soviet missile launch sites are being installed on the island of Cuba from a mission flown by a spy plane. For the next two weeks, the Americans and Soviets engaged in intense diplomacy over the new threat. The crisis very nearly turned the Cold War into a hot one, with both sides fearing all-out nuclear war. Fortunately, that outcome was averted, and in the wake of the Cuban Missile Crisis, both the United States and the Soviet Union sought to improve relations. The stage had been set for future cooperation between the superpowers. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, peaceful cooperation seemed unlikely. In late 1957, the Soviet Union achieved a world first by placing Sputnik into orbit, swiftly followed by launching the first living organism into space, Laika. The United States space program struggled to catch up to Soviet advances. There were a number of failures during the year, and the United States promptly announced them. The first and most spectacular of these was Vanguard at the end of 1957. There were other Vanguard failures, all achieved takeoff, but trouble occurred either in the second or third stages. To make matters worse, in 1960, an American U-2 spy plane was shot down deep within Soviet airspace, causing great embarrassment to the U.S. and prompting further deterioration of U.S.-Soviet relations. While there were advocates for collaboration from both sides, there was simply no good way to venture towards this goal. Meanwhile, in the race for space, the Soviet Union still had a commanding lead, being the first to put a man and woman in space, then followed by conducting the first spacewalk. In 1962, President Kennedy had famously proclaimed his desire for a moon landing to be accomplished before the end of the decade, and the newly formed National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, was charged with accomplishing this feat. The race for the moon was on. Both the United States and the Soviet Union vied for being the first to place a man on the moon, but it was America that got there first, placing Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon in 1969. This event captivated the world, and also firmly planted the U.S. ahead of the USSR. Being highly critical of Apollo missions, and in the case of Apollo 14, they criticized U.S. intrusion into Laos. In this, they attacked U.S. policy more than recognizing successes in space. Change was about to happen, though. In 1962, the Dryden-Blagenrarov Agreement was signed to promote cooperation on meteorology, geomagnetism, and satellite communications. President Kennedy stressed the importance of cooperation in space in his speech at Rice University, and even proposed a joint lunar expedition in a 1963 UN speech. There began a push for international cooperation beginning with Nixon's presidency. NASA's dwindling budget also led to a surge for partnerships with other nations. Through informal communications and a subsequent meeting in Moscow, the possibility of a rendezvous and docking system between the two nations' space programs was explored. Both sides saw the possibility of cutting back on money expenditure on space by sharing in future ventures. A mission to test the resulting system was also proposed, and by December 1971, engineers from both sides determined that a test flight was both technically feasible and desirable. Thus, the Apollo-Soyuz Test Project, or ASTP, was a go. The treaty that formally sealed the deal not only outlined the need for a test flight for future joint missions, it also encouraged cooperation in other scientific fields such as meteorology, biology, and medicine. Through unprecedented efforts to collaborate and establish favorable relations, the ASTP symbolizes the crowning achievement of detente and paved the way for future space missions to come, setting the stage for international involvement and collaboration in space. While cosmonauts, astronauts, and flight controllers learned and trained together, before ASTP, 
Both sides bought into the propaganda and biases of their government and media, which painted Americans as greedy capitalists and Soviets as determined to bury the West. The project challenged those assumptions. One of the most difficult problems to overcome was the language barrier. The Russians learned to speak English and the Americans Russian. They would then speak the other's language throughout the course of the mission. We had a lot of fun because everybody made mistakes in the other language. and. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, like learning a, uh, listening to a three-year-old uh, trying to get better in English. <laughs> uh, so we made mistakes and everybody got a lot of laughs out of that. This mission also marked the first time that manned spacecraft of two nations have met in space for joint engineering and scientific investigation. The joint effort symbolized the policy of detente pursued by the Nixon administration. This strategy strived to lessen tensions between the two superpowers and to pursue shared interests in the spirit of friendship and camaraderie. On July 15, 1975, the test flight began with Soyuz 19. Apollo followed a few hours later. Orbital adjustments were made over the next two days, and the two spacecraft docked on July 17 over the Atlantic Ocean. The historic event was broadcast live over television across the world allowing people everywhere to see the opening of the hatches, the greeting of the crews, and the beginning of joint activities. The unprecedented openness of the Soviet space program also meant Soyuz 19 was the first Soviet mission to have a televised launch and landing, in which Western correspondents in Moscow watched on color TVs in the press center. It was really the handshake uh, which symbolized uh, potential lessening of tension in the Cold War and, and friendship. May our joint work in space serve for the benefit of all countries and peoples on the Earth. Press reaction to the mission was generally positive. To many, the ASTP was seen as the unofficial end of the space race and the beginning of a new era in space exploration. Both Soviet Communist Party General Secretary Leonov Brezhnev and U.S. President Gerald Ford called the crews in space, and later exchanged letters praising the mission. Brezhnev called the ASTP a symbol of the current process of easing international tension and improvement of Soviet-US relations on the basis of the principles of peaceful coexistence. And Ford replied with, best wishes for the continued development of mutually beneficial cooperation and good relations between our two countries. Both Ford and Brezhnev committed themselves to a transcultural future in space due to the commonalities among experts found across borders. Historians have analyzed the painstaking steps taken during the project to ensure equal amounts of effort and cooperation between the two nations. The care taken to make contact without a host-guest hierarchy is impressive in that it transcended celestial territory, forming diplomacy that rose above geopolitical tensions. Even jokes rose above earthly boundaries as throughout the mission duration in space, both crews entangled themselves in pranks and jokes. Such interaction personalized the moment without actually subverting the program. In orbit, each crew would host the other in varying configurations, from dining on the other nation's signature dishes to exchanging of national and UN flags, tree seeds, documents, and experiments. Even the docking system itself was a representation of the balancing act the mission was. Jointly designed between the Soviet Union and the United States, not only did it act as an airlock between the two spacecraft, it also allowed both to take either the active or passive role in the docking procedure, and thus not allowing one nation to hold power above the other. This was a major step forward in the political ideology of the period, one of coexistence, not of mutual destruction. With the two spacecraft in space joined, so were the nations on Earth. However, today, the ASTP's legacy appears forgotten, lost to the annals of history. Few outside of NASA know about its success and its positive impact on US-Soviet relations in the Cold War. It plowed new ground in international relations and lessened antagonism between the two superpowers. As the first multinational mission in space, it formed the basis from which all missions since have been based upon. The Space Shuttle Mir program has been a natural extension, and today, NASA and its international partners continue the spirit of cooperation among the nations of the world with the International Space Station.